Hello, and welcome to Green Heart Connects. I'm Marcel, and I'll be your host. We are so glad that you're here. Green Heart Connects is a monthly series where like-minded people gather and exchange ideas for changing our ways for caring for the earth and for each other. Through facilitated discussions and curated presentations, people from around the world share inspiring stories, tips, suggestions, and resources to improve local communities and the world. Green Heart Connects is brought to you by Green Heart International, a not-for-profit organization facilitating global understanding through cultural exchange programs for Americans and young people around the world. Thank you for being here. Exchange has the power to broaden perspectives and to change lives. Are you ready to connect people and planet? Let's go. episode of Green Heart Connects, we are going to talk about fair trade with Chris Salt, Executive Director of the Fair Trade Federation. Fair trade is an alternative business model that values people, the planet, and profits equally. More than one-sixth of the world's population lives on less than one U.S. dollar per day. Fair trade aims to combat this widespread poverty by providing opportunity for economically disadvantaged producers, ensuring safe working conditions and the rights of women and children, and prioritizing environmental sustainability throughout all stages of production. As we enter the holiday shopping season, Greenheart Connects thinks it'll be helpful to discuss what makes fair trade fair and to learn more about ways to support it through the stores that you shop at, the products that you purchase, and the choices that you make. After Chris's presentation, we'll meet back here for a live Q&A with Chris. So let's get going. Hello, I'm very excited to be here talking with the Greenheart Connects community. Uh, my name is Chris Solt. I'm the executive director of the Fair Trade Federation. And we're going to be talking fair trade and not just shopping conscientiously for the holidays, but we're going to talk about what is fair trade and how can you participate. Fair Trade Federation is a community of fair trade enterprises committed to fair trade in everything that they do. So I'm sure a fair amount have heard the concept of fair trade. Now, if I asked you to define it, I'm sure that many of you would say things like women's empowerment or no child labor or sustainable environmental practices or paying a living wage, and you would all be right. That is uh, both a challenge and an opportunity we need to have some common frame of reference. So the Fair Trade Federation uses this definition. It's a trading partnership based on dialogue, transparency, respect that seeks greater equity in international trade. The problem that fair trade addresses is inequity. The global trade that occurs is not on a level playing field. Conventional trade, is motivated by profit maximization. It's for the benefit of your shareholders. And it is irrespective of anything that happens along the supply chain. When you have 
complex supply chains across multiple countries for multinational corporations, some that supersede the power of, of local country governments um, to be held accountable for the way that they practice business and trade. It is all for profit maximization. And if you think about how long um, some of these supply chains are, let's say you go into a store, a uh, big box store, and you just want to buy a t-shirt. Think about all of the, the people that are involved in that supply chain, getting that shirt to your hands in that store. And in conventional trade, because it's all about profit maximization, there are tons of people along the way. Traditionally, they're called middlemen. They take a cut. And with conventional trade, often the people that made it get the least amount of the value that you pay for when you purchase that t-shirt. It has profound implications. Fair trade is different than conventional trade. It is about mission primacy or stakeholder primacy. In the Fair Trade Federation Code of Practice, it is required that for every business decision that that fair trade enterprise makes, that everyone involved in the supply chain is considered. A lot of the characteristics that make up a fair trade enterprise, we found those same um, characteristics help that enterprise sustain itself through challenges like the pandemic that we're experiencing right now. It is a, uh, a long-term sustainable approach to business. Just put aside the really good feeling it, it gives you when you purchase something that you consume or you wear that doesn't come at the cost of somebody's dignity, sustainability, or health. Put that on the shelf for now. Just make the business case. It is a much better longer term sustainable business decision to align yourself this way in, in the fair trade movement's opinion that everyone that is involved that provides value is considered when any decision is made so that everyone can share in the risk and the rewards. Um, that's a much more sustainable way to operate your business. So when things happen that disrupt your supply chain or the market's supply or demand, that everyone is kept moving. Um, in April and May, when the pandemic was really ramping up, big multinational corporations were canceling orders in countries and borders were being closed down and they were canceling orders and not paying. Um, but yet their CEOs and board of directors were taking, you know, windfalls of bonuses. It was, that's a very stark difference to a fair trade enterprise. You know, we've had a, a really good example. One of our members, um, Fair Anita, they quickly pivoted to making masks because they have these long-term relationships with their artisans and they didn't just cut orders and say, hey, our orders really fell off a cliff, so sorry. They said, hey, we want to keep working with you. What can we do to keep you engaged and employed and safe and productive? So they pivoted to making masks. And they said, well, we don't want to profit off the pandemic. So all of the profits from the masks are going to those co-ops that are producing them. Now, of course, Farinita, um, in exchange, they have promoted this, right? As a fair trade enterprise, we are a different business. So these are Fair Trade Federation members, all very, very different in the way that they practice trade, but all um, committing to behave with fair trade principles and fair trade values at the core of every business decision. And in our code of practice, it says that every business decision must take into account the livelihood and sustainability and dignity of everyone involved in the production of the products that that enterprise sells. Now, with a large global movement with lots of different players in it, we wanted to have a, a common core definition that defines how we work to transform trade in order to achieve justice, equity, and sustainability for people and the planet. And this is a really important part at the core of the Fair Trade Charter that asserts that justice and sustainable development should be at the heart of all trade structures. So the Fair Trade Federation has nine principles and it's not just, you know, two or three of the nine is, is acceptable. It's all nine. 
that our members commit to for every aspect of their enterprise. So the first one is create opportunities. So fair trade is a strategy for poverty alleviation and sustainable development. Our members create social and economic opportunities through trading partnerships with marginalized producers. Members place the interests of producers in their communities as the primary concern of their enterprise. So mission primacy, part of the goal and reason why the enterprise exists is to create opportunities, not negotiate down to the lowest possible price at every step of the supply chain. The next one to develop transparent and accountable relationships, because this is talking about the way in which you behave with your um, relationships. So it involves relationships that are open, fair, consistent, and respectful. FTF members show consideration for both customers and producers by sharing information about the entire trading chain through honest and proactive communication. If problems arise, members work cooperatively with fair trade partners and other organizations to implement solutions. What essentially the first part of this is saying is that don't be a jerk. <laughs> you know, it's a polite way of saying that. I mean, I'm being silly, but it's kind of true. The next is that um, not only is it important to behave properly, but that transparency is essential, right? So first is that customers are given access to information about producers, makers, farmers, artisans, right? And then it's essential that they share that information. They must do that in a very, very respectful way. It is in partnership with artisans, farmers around the world so that they may, in partnership, equitably realize their entire humanity. So that's really, really important. And customers must be given access to that. If you wanna see a supply chain change, add accountability and transparency. It will change fundamentally and quickly. If you think about, I'm not gonna say a name, but if you think about um, a large big box retailer in the United States and Canada that sells craft supplies. So they spend an inordinate amount of resources and time and effort to obfuscate and hide their supply chains, right? If you go, if you go to one of their products, probably from China or Bangladesh or something, and you go up to one of their sales associates and say, tell me about the people that made this, they have zero information. And that's on purpose. So whereas a fair trade enterprise, that's fundamentally different because every part of that supply chain should be available to the customer. So the next um, principle is build capacity. In our principles, it means that you are required to develop producers' independence. It might seem counterintuitive, but fair trade enterprises do not want to be a, a matriarchal or patriarchal kind of relationship with their suppliers. Like if they stopped existing, then their suppliers and artisans and farmers would have no opportunities. The, the most important thing is that if I am a fair trade enterprise in the United States, for example, and I'm dealing with um, an artisan co-op in the Lake Atiklan region of Guatemala, I do not want to be their only customer, right? I want to build their capacity so that they can sell locally and they can sell to other customers so that if I went down, they do not. That's a really, really important thing. How crazy it might seem to some people that are looking at this with a traditional business lens. Okay, so there's two dressmakers, Mata Traders and Maggie's Organics. They both make clothing. They're both fantastic fair trade enterprises. You could say, hey, they're competitors. They're, they make the same kind of clothing, but also they're fair trade enterprises and they're fair trade federation members. So they actually combine some of their promotion efforts. They've done some cooperative marketing campaigns and they actually talk with each other and share some best practices. Well, that's Collaboration. So I've been using the term coopetition to explain what it is very unique about a fair trade enterprise. And it is very, very different than almost any other industry. Now, in build capacity, we're saying too that members help producers build capacity through proactive communication, financial and technical assistance, market information, and dialogue. They seek to share lessons learned 
to spread best practices and to strengthen the connections between communities, including and among producer groups. So the best example is for a fair trade enterprise to develop a co-op so much that they walk away and they don't need them anymore. Like that's actually kind of visionary or aspirational, but it's absolutely the right goal. The next fair trade federation principle is to promote fair trade. You have to participate. It is a global movement, you know, promote their values that they have committed to. The next one is to pay promptly and fairly. Um, so here's a really stark example between a conventional trading business and a fair trade enterprises. So, okay. So conventional business goes into a buying relationship and they agree on terms. They agree on you know, the sample or whatever. I'm just making up a general example. And then what happens, right? So that producer then is committed to delivering fair, that, that producer has to go and pay its workers. It has to go and buy the, the raw materials. Um, it has to pay its own expenses, you know, electricity and all the things that you could think of to produce whatever it was. Then they have to ship it, right? So all of the risk is in that producer organization, if anything happens. So then contrast that with the fair trade enterprise. Many fair trade enterprises pay 50%, sometimes even up to 100% in advance when they make the order itself no work has even started no resources have been purchased and that is really essential so think about some countries where there is a level of poverty you know they will deal with a conventional trader they will go to a money lender because access to capital in some countries is almost non-existent think about indigenous communities where racism and institutional barriers they just have zero access they just forget, you know, having access to capital. It's very, very hard. So then that person would go to some local money lender. That's where a lot of exploitation can happen, where people end up in a cycle of debt that they can't get out of. They have become indentured servitudes and essentially that's part and parcel of the modern slavery industry. So that's an extreme example, but. That does not happen in a fair trade enterprise because the risk has been shared along the whole supply chain so that they have money to go pay their workers, buy the raw materials, um, to produce the items, then ship them. It's a conversation. It's a relationship. And because of build capacity, they have a vested interest in the success of this order. The next is support safe and empowering working conditions. Think about worker protections like masks, health kits, ventilation, um, just real basic things that you might assume that those exist, but in a lot of places they just do not because they cost money or they slow down production. And not only is it safe and healthy working conditions, but our members seek to eliminate discrimination based on race, caste, national origin, religion, disability, gender, sexual orientation, union membership, political affiliation, age, marital, or health status. Okay, the next, ensure the rights of children. If you have ever eaten chocolate and it's not fair trade chocolate, well, I'm sorry to say that likely um, at some point in the supply chain to bring cacao to the company to make that chocolate bar, children were involved. Fair trade having children be able to be children right is so essential now you think about countries where fair trade products might be produced and you might think oh well you know the children are around they might be at home they might be even helping and that's actually encouraged that's great right but children must be allowed to go to school and to be children that is really, really important. And our members must demonstrate to us from a systems perspective that they are assured that children involved in any of the relationships, producer, farmer, or artisan, that they have that ample opportunity. Okay, um, the next is to cultivate environmental stewardship. So 
our members seek to offer current generations the ability to meet their needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Members actively consider the implications of their decisions on the environment and promote responsible stewardship of resources. Members reduce, reuse, reclaim, and recycle materials wherever possible. They encourage environmentally sustainable practices throughout the entire trading chain. Some of our members excel at this using recycled, upcycled, reused, repurposed materials. It's incredible. And they're some of my favorite products. Um, I have a messenger bag that is made out of discarded fish feed bag from Phnom Penh, Cambodia. My, my wallet is made out of recycled inner tubes from bicycles. Um, I, I find great delight and joy in those products. And a lot of our members do so much to be good stewards of the environment. But I also want to just be very clear, nothing is perfect, right? There is no zero carbon supply chain. These are still products that are being shipped globally. So there's just that reality. But it is a continuous improvement spectrum that is so important to consider when dealing with particularly this issue. We have more work to do, but in a lot of ways, fair trade enterprises and our members are also leading the way, showing conventional and large multinational corporations that not only is this possible to do within your supply chains, but customers want them. And then the last, um, but not least, is to respect cultural identity. Our members celebrate in the cultural diversity of communities while seeking to create positive and equitable change. Members respect the development of products, practices, and organizational models based on indigenous traditions and techniques to sustain cultures and revitalize traditions. Members balance market needs with producers' cultural heritage. We honor and preserve, and I'd say even promote traditional craft methods. A lot of the gourd products, gourd carving products is a fun example from Peru. If you look at the old ancient tradition of gourd carving, I know it might sound silly and we're right in the middle of fall here and we're probably eating some pumpkin spice something or other. But if you look at the traditional gourd carving, they are masterpieces. So, and that's a dying art because um, oh, there's a younger generation that, that aren't really excited about that, except for organizations that are taking that traditional craft style and making marketable products like a Christmas ornament on a smaller gourd, right? So they're not only providing opportunity for a dignified income, but they're also keeping a traditional craft um, technique alive um, where otherwise it would likely die. It's seemingly simple, right? Fair trade. It's the concept seems like if you asked a, if you asked a kindergartner on the playground, what's fair, they could probably answer it pretty darn quick. Now for somebody like me within the fair trade movement, it gets really complex when you talk about all of the different approaches to fair trade along a spectrum. It is very, very important to the fair trade movement that if an enterprise is going to use the terms fair trade that they align themselves with a third party certifier or verifier of some kind to assure customers and artisans and farmers that what I am saying is actually true. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality. And a lot of larger multinational corporations are paying attention to the fair trade movement and seeing that increasingly customers are demanding and wanting their products to not be made at the cost of others' health and sustainability and dignity. So they're looking at the market share saying, how can we get in some of that? And they're doing you know, as little as possible. I'm not being entirely fair, but I've seen it happen a lot. And it would be minimal investment and maximum PR and promotion. And okay, so they're doing a little bit, that's good, but the fair trade movement wants to invite them into a longer and deeper conversation about really looking at their entire enterprise. It's, it's good that they are paying attention now. We try to learn about each certification and what they stand for, right? So there's Fairtrade International, then there's Fairtrade Certified, which is Fairtrade USA. There's Fair for Life and Fairtrade Federation and the WFTO. 
the certifiers that certify large companies is kind of the beginning of the conversation. They're the ones that are saying, hey, here's a big company like Ben and Jerry's or Starbucks. They're doing a little bit, like maybe less than 2% of all of Starbucks coffee is sold under fair trade terms. That's good, but they should be doing a lot more, right? And Starbucks is definitely not a uh, mission primacy organization at all. You can just look it up on the stock exchange. So you can buy fair trade certified jeans at Target now. Now it's interesting. I'm going to encourage all of you to look behind the label because that fair trade certified label, I think is a good thing, right? And more companies should be doing that, but they should also be doing so much more. That fair trade certified label is for a portion of the supply chain. It is for the sewing. So, you know, the denim is, is an organic, who's to say, you know, about the mission primacy of the organization or not, probably not, but at least those wage workers in that one factory were guaranteed a living wage and they had the fair trade premium in which they could vote to decide democratically what that money went to, whether it was a local development project or water improvement or whatever their local community wanted to. Now that's good. And there should be more of that in the world, but on the other end, a fair trade federation or world WFTO verified fair trade enterprise. It is in everything that they do that fair trade must be the guiding concept. Verification on the left and certification on the right, right? There are definitely different approaches, but both have uh, value to contribute. For those consumers that want to express their values in the marketplace, you know, all of this adds up to get to know the companies that you support with your dollars. You have incredible power as a consumer. And every time you spend, you're casting a vote for the world that you want to have. Make sure that at least you look for a fair trade certified mark on that product. That's where I would start. When you want to be assured, look for the mark of trust when you purchase a product and also learn about those marks of trust. I was first introduced to the concept of fair trade when I was on a road trip. I stopped in a little town called Niagara on the Lake, and there was a little gift store there called 10,000 Villages. And they had beautiful um, products from all over the world. And I was really, I was a musician and they had some drums and shakers. And I just had a great time looking at them all and learning about the countries. And that really stuck with me. And then later when I was in university, I studied social science. I started learning about, you know, colonialism and global history and started reading some really interesting authors um, like Howard Zinn, who wrote uh, kind of these alternative histories, which I found very refreshing. I was also studying to be a social studies teacher and read a really amazing book called Lies My Teacher Told Me which really argued for integrated curriculum, right? So multiple, uh, you know, multiple topics, uh, economics, sociology, history, anthropology, and so on. And you teach it in modern terms, and then you go backwards. So the concept is teaching integrated curriculum and history backwards. And I love that. That connected to other interests that I had um, reading and, and studying a lot about Noam Chomsky, um, who's kind of a legendary, um, you know, progressive critical thinker that taught history that I wasn't really being taught in, you know, in high school or, or in university as well. So not, not to say that that's the only path to understanding this, but for me, you know, as a young man, like it really opened my eyes to, to the real history, I, I would argue of our planet and colonialism in particular and why I can go or any one of you can go to a Walmart store and buy a t-shirt made out of cotton, which is a, um, a crop that we all know and have grown up with wearing cotton clothes, I'm sure. And one of the um, crops that uses the most amount of pesticides in the world 
and we can buy that t-shirt at Walmart for a couple of dollars. And if you think about how much labor and water and pesticides and just the shipping, um, the all of that that goes into making that t-shirt and how that t-shirt could be only a couple dollars. I mean, that, that, that started to really bother me um, and it should bother everyone in my opinion um, because we know that if that shirt was made in a union shop in the United States, it would not be a couple dollars. And just try to think about why is that? Why would a t-shirt here being made out of organic cotton because we wouldn't wanna you know, pollute our neighborhoods and, and our streams. So, and we also would wanna have a fair wage for that person that made that, like all of you would want to be, you know, to have that opportunity. And then think about the real cost of what that shirt would be. And then compare that shirt with a $2 or $3 shirt at Walmart. And just consider why is it that there's such a difference? That should bother everyone. Once I, dis once I really um, dove into fair trade, it just all made sense to me. It was a way for me to express my values, um, not only as a consumer, but if you look up the, the original Latin term vocare, um, it, which is we use the term vocation, right? It's not just a job or a career, it's more of a calling. And lots of different cultures and languages have different words for this, but vocare, I think I really like because it, it, it sums up like all of the values and interests and motivations to try to live and affect the world around you, like in a way that you would want to see the world, right? And so I felt like, wow, I really am quite grateful, whether or not I'm successful or not, or I, you know, I'm not in this for to, to be rich, obviously. So, you know, it just, all the stars aligned and I just felt so grateful to kind of be able to leverage my skills and experience in a way that actually made a difference within this movement. You all have an opportunity to participate in the fair trade movement. First, those interested in business or trade can start your own fair trade enterprise. You could also align your values with your vocation and career and work for a like-minded organization. And the Fair Trade Federation has a job board that you can check free periodically. You can also work with fair trade campaigns. You can make your town, your university, or school or congregation a fair trade certified town or university, school or congregation. You, if you're a teacher or educator, you can incorporate fair trade into lesson plans. You can shop online and express your values as a consumer and make your dollars uh, align with your worldview. You can also shop in a store or cafe. We provided a link to our store finder. You can also ask for fair trade products where you already shop. You'd be surprised that if you talk to your local grocer or gift store and you ask them to carry fair trade products and why, they have the opportunity and would, will likely align. You can also give fair trade products as gift to those either who already know about fair trade or don't know and introduce them to the concept. You can also go deeper once you've learned about all of the different ways you can participate in the fair trade movement and learn about really innovative cutting edge um, approaches like regenerative organic certification or the co-op movement or if you're an activist, you can work in food justice. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about fair trade with all of you. Obviously, it's a very, very big topic with lots of different moving parts. And I tried to keep it concise for our conversation and uh, look forward to hearing about all of the ways that you are going to participate in the fair trade movement in the coming years.
today from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Please welcome Chris Salt. We are so excited to have you here, Chris. Hello, uh, nice to see you. I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here with you and to talk through fair trade. That's excellent. And first of all, thanks for sharing your extensive knowledge on fair trade. I think we've all learned quite a bit today, um, even if we started from zero today. So <laughs> I'm sure everyone is curious to learn more about this. So let's jump into the Q&A segment. So for everyone who's attending today, if you haven't done so already, please say your name, where you're joining us from, and uh, state your question in the field below. And I will be asking Chris during this live segment. So I can start. You mentioned uh, during the presentation, you have an incredible power as a consumer, which rings true. And I think that's something that we tend not to think about um, too often, unfortunately. So right off the bat, I'm thinking of chocolate bars <laughs> because I that's a good thing to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I consume those on a regular basis. And so I just checked my stash at five here. Um, and I was looking for the fair trade mark. And out of this five, I have two that have the fair trade mark or um, fair trade certified. And so you know, that's just something for me to be more aware of the next time I go out and replenish my chocolate bars. But that got me thinking, how much of the price that we pay for the fair trade items actually goes to the producers, in this case, the chocolate bars? Yeah, I love this question. Um, and it's um, one that I've been asked, um, you know, in over 15 years in fair trade. And I can say from the from my experience working in handmade stores and think about I've been asked this mostly when I've been in stores like a 10,000 village store or a fair trade gift store. Um, they would pick up a mug and say how much goes back to the artisan with this. Um, and the answer in the handmade world is zero, surprisingly. Um, but there, it's really important to know that why is it zero? Why am I answering it that way is that that artisan and that producer has already been paid way in advance before the product gets here, before it comes to the warehouse. Um, many Fairtrade Federation and WFTO members pay in advance up to 50% when they place the order, right? As I mentioned um, in the presentation that um, when you leave a company on its own devices to be able to pay its workers, pay its expenses and um, uh, source raw materials, um, that can be pretty challenging and I, I'm overgeneralizing because there's lots of different um, types of supply chains, with this, especially in handmade products. So when you pay 50% upfront, they don't have to go to money lenders. They don't have to go see capital. They have enough to produce. And then a lot of them will pay when they ship. So that means that you think about that, the risk involved in producing and um packaging and exporting products is shared and absorbed by the importing fair trade enterprise, right? So that everyone has already been completely paid by the time it, it ships from the country. So, so that's why the answer is a little surprising, which is zero, right? Now, you're probably wanting to know like, okay, so this mug, you buy it for $15. How much of that goes there? So, so that's much more of a complicated question because, um, you know, establishing a living fair wage in each community where these products are produced is the goal, right? That is, that's the baseline. And then the discussion about pricing is a partnership, right? Where all of the considerations, even like long-term sustainability is introduced into that conversation. I know it's a little bit, maybe a longer <laughs> answer than you were thinking of, but in the chocolate world, which uses like the ones you use, like looking for the fair trade certified mark, that really depends on the individual company, right? Um, some of them like Divine Chocolate is a co -op -a co cooperative where it is a worker owned cooperative. So that that is decided by the actual group itself, how it gets paid, how much everyone, you know, contributes and what, how do they share in the profits? So again, Back to my, my point that it is kind of a challenge. It's not easy, right? It, it, the fair trade movement doesn't make it easy um, for you to understand that very simple question, right? 
that's kind of more how I was raised, like the charity model, like I buy this and this person gets X, right? And it's not so, it's not so black and white and for lots of reasons. So right. hope that, hope that answers that. Yeah, it does. Because at the end of the day, we are taking a step yes. in the direction and like many things in the world, the answers are never black and white. There's yes. always nuances. Um, but I think the most important thing, what I'm taking away is that by purchasing free trade, I am part of the solution to make the world a better place. Absolutely. Yes. General. Yeah. But what you said just now um, actually resonated with one of our viewers here. We have a question from Evan in Chicago. He asked, what would you consider to be the greatest challenge fair trade enterprises currently face? Oh my. Wow, Evan, thank you so much for your question. Boy, this is the thing that I that keeps me up at night. You know, that's kind of my job to be worrying about these things. Wow, that is a great question. The the greatest challenge. So, boy, that is a $64 million question. <laughs> I'd say right now, honestly, it's um it's being able to be sustainable, obviously, you know, the pandemic is a huge challenge and it's affecting, um, it's affecting people who are marginalized much deeper than those who are not. Um, you know, it, it's affecting everyone in the whole planet, but I'd say those that are already in um, marginalized, not economically and socially, but also they're marginalized with the climate crisis, um, those are the biggest um, challenges. And, you know, related to that, um, I'd say, irrespective of the pandemic, right, that's something we're all facing. I'd say, if you put that on the shelf just for a moment, really, the greatest challenge is the climate crisis, right? If you think about coffee, um, if you think about cotton, and, and agricultural products in particular, even all of the raw materials and plant fibers that are grown, right? Those are grown in our planet. And there's uh, the example of Maggie's Organics I used when comparing uh, the cooperation between Mata Traders and Maggie's Organics, right? So Maggie's Organics is a real concrete example where they had built these supply chains and had organic farmers growing cotton in Central and South America. And with climate change, it's, they, it's, a done deal. They they cannot grow cotton anymore. So they've had to move their entire supply chain. This is just because of climate change and climate crisis. And the other thing um, you're seeing, even with um, the hurricanes Ido right now that are sweeping through Central America, when somebody is in a um, when somebody is marginalized and they are their literal safety and livelihood is put at risk because of our changing climate, that is. From a business, purely business standpoint, um, a very, very huge challenge. So that's that's probably there's there's many others, <laughs> of course, but um, but the climate crisis is the one that affects everyone. Right, and it's very interconnected. Um, it's not just one separate item disconnected. Everything that we do have an impact to the world, and everything is impacting each other. And I think that's definitely worth remembering. Um, we have Laura from Arizona um, asking about, um, she mentioned the, she mentioned, Chris, you mentioned about the importance of storytelling. What is one of your favorite success stories for positive impact in a community? Hmm. Oh boy, there's so many. And I don't necessarily want to speak for some of our brands, um, you know, or, 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 you know, telling really personal stories, but, but I can say that when I, so when I visited, I, I guess it's personal, um, when I visited um, uh, Delhi, India in 2017, um, I met someone who, uh, an old friend that I had made when I was there in 2008. And um, he um, worked for or works for Asha Handicrafts in Mumbai, India. And we had visited a, a, a jewelry workshop um, in Rajasthan. It was a, just a small group um, working in their homes. It was a, a small workshop in this gentleman's home. 
and um, they were, were not yet up and running. They had uh, just started production and very, very intensive work from Asha Handicrafts, sending social workers and, and business development people um, and, um, and designers to help them build their capacity. Um, and so that was 2008. Um, 2017, when I was talking with Ivan, he said they've employed 30 people now in their village. Um, they have a nurse that comes once a week um, for anyone in the village that's paid from a premium that they're spreading throughout the, their little community in Rajasthan. And that the young children that I had met, this gentleman's children, were, um, he had three daughters. Um, now, women and young girls are the ones that tend to be left out and more marginalized than not. They tend to be the ones that will not be chosen to go to school because the, you know, it's expensive. So just, I mean, I could keep going on and on, but just to see the, the profound impact rather than um, one person becoming kind of wealthy from a business opportunity to somebody looking at it and spreading the wealth around his community, knowing that, as you said, we're all interconnected. And to see that his daughters were all in school and they were doing well, just that was such a stark example for me. Um, and it was exclusively through building a fair trade relationship from Asha Handicrafts and Asha Handicrafts exporting to fair trade enterprises in, in Europe, Australia, Japan, and the United States and Canada. Um, that really hit me um, to see uh, uh, from two that for like nine years <laughs> of, of longitudinal impact. So that's my favorite success story. And there's so many others, of course. Of course, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. We have a question from Carol in Tennessee. Her question is, what are the key distinctions among the various fair trade labels? For example, do they certify or verify different industries, different countries, different places on the supply chain? Um, so she gives some examples. There's yeah. fair trade for life, fair trade certified, fair trade international. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? <laughs> I could talk for hours and hours about this, <laughs> and I have before. Um, yeah, so this is the thing that is the most challenging in the fair trade movement is all of the different ways in which fair trade can be manifested and, and practiced and enacted. Um, so Fair for Life is, is, is a smaller player. Um, and I know, I know a couple of those people and they, um, their, their certification is more of a holistic model. They've moved from purely product certification and they, they kind of borrow a little bit of the B Corp. If you, if any of you are familiar with certified B Corp, um, I encourage you to go look at Fair for Life and their standards online. They're published online. You can look at them. Um, and I, I can't really speak to them with any kind of authority, um, and I also encourage you to look at um, B Corp. Um, they have a, they're really really great approach to having a um, a self assessment report and some big pillars of ways in which lots of different types of businesses, even accounting firm or an insurance company, can express their values. Right, and I think there needs to be way more of that in the world. Not necessarily traders, but that's really great. Um, so um, Fair for Life, I know that has worked from product certification into more of a holistic certification. They are um, evolving their model, so they're they're not they're probably one of the smaller players um, in the commodity certification market. Um, Fair Trade Certified, Fair Trade USA, is the one that is probably I'd say honestly the most controversial within the Fair Trade movement. So a real quick history lesson: in 2010, um, there was Transfair. If you look, if you do a Google search on transfer, there was a different logo. And that was the international system that was um, the standard, right? You know, the, the green and the blue yin yang that you see on Ben and Jerry's and Starbucks coffee and Costco, for example. Um, so at that point, transfer was left the fair trade international system. And the key difference, and, and there was a different kind of um, theory of change, right? So the Fairtrade International System really focuses on co-ops. The concept that if you are fair trade, you must have the ability for everyone involved to be able to organize and have a say, right? And so that, if you think that's the requirement to be to participate in any fair trade, then 
there are certain groups that can, there are certain countries that can, there are certain um, products that, that can be produced using the co-op model. Now, the transfer spun off into Fairtrade USA. It did anger, quite honestly, some of the kind of Fairtrade International core that said, You're, this is not what Fairtrade should be. And so there's a different change maker opinion. And um, so Fairtrade USA um, removed the requirement for co-ops, but recommended it, right? So that's uh, not, a, not a subtle thing um, in that then that allows Fairtrade USA to go in and certify a factory, right? It can be owned by a company. It's just certifying, like the example of the, the Fairtrade certified jeans, right? So these are wage workers. They're not democratically organized. They might not even be able to form a union, which is also another point of contention, certainly. But, you know, just to, to, be, to be fair, there are definitely valid um, theories of change. And this says, okay, those wage workers, from their perspective, those wage workers are, through no fault of their own, not allowed or ineligible to participate in the fair trade system. So they said that doesn't seem right to them. So they said, we're going to use the certification to be able to protect their work when they are at this, this place of, or facility, right? So that means they get you know, safe working conditions, all the good things that are really essential to fair trade, safe working conditions, um, empowerment, gender equity, um, and the fair trade premium, right? And that is the premium that is paid into an account and then all of the people that are there have some say to a greater or lesser extent in the way that that is spent, right? So um, so Fairtrade USA is probably the biggest market share right now in, in North America and they are going into things that not typical for Fairtrade products historically. So Patagonia is working with them. Um, they're certifying domestic farms where we have migrant workers that again, through no fault of their own, through their, because of their geographic displacement um, economically, they are certifying um, pr produce harvesting. So you could go to Whole Foods Market and see a, a zucchini is fair trade certified or a dozen roses is fair trade certified. So it's a much bigger approach, um, but from the fair trade international um, perspective, it's a little too wide, you know? And so now, I think that, as I mentioned, there's a spectrum of fair trade from the big, big multinationals that are that are kind of starting the conversation all the way to the equal exchanges and like the super dedicated activists uh, for food justice and you know union membership and democratically self-determined workers. So all have something to contribute, but there are different. So I hope I didn't go on too long, but that's like the most concise version I can give. That's excellent. I mean, it's good to um, also learn about the history behind it and understand all of the different areas that might be impacting how we shop fair trade. And just one last question, and this is a very good one from Jason. How do you recommend bringing fair trade into the conversation with family and friends who may not be very familiar with the concept? Yeah. Boy, I love that question. Um, I... Boy, that is a great question. I've never been asked that before. I love that. So, um, yeah, that's really challenging because so I, I, I'd say you have to, I would recommend kind of meeting them where they are, right? Maybe, maybe, so for some, this might be odd to think, but for some, this is a, this is a turnoff. And here's an example. So I was in a fair trade store in Tennessee. Um, I, it was late at night and there was a couple that came in and um, they were shopping and, um, you know, the, the, the woman of the couple was like looking at the jewelry and she was so excited. And then she found out, oh, these, you know, this is, this makes a difference. And she was just never heard about it before. She just blossomed. was so excited. She was going to spend hundreds of dollars and her husband was just kind of rolling his eyes. And then he came up to these coffee mugs and he's like, oh, these are really interesting. What, you know, tell me about these. I said, they're, they're a fair trade um, from a, from a co-op in uh, Bien Chan in Vietnam. And when I said that, he like shut down. He was a Vietnam vet. And we had this amazing conversation about 
you know, for him, it was such a trigger and it was it definitely triggered some trauma in his life, obviously. But we had this conversation about why is it do we work with this group? And and he his argument was there's poverty in the United States. Why should I buy this when there's suffering in the United States? And so just this one example of um, trying to understand what is it about where these workers were in Vietnam that made it um, compelling for us to work in this way. And once he understood the difference of like, especially the social safety nets and the environmental conditions in each of these places where people were working and that they deserved a fair wage, just like he deserved to have a union job working at a Ford plant. Once you make a connection like that, fairness, equity, you know, dignity, if you, if you talk about that first, like, and, and even the concept of read behind the label, I think that is, that is where I would go. I know maybe that's not the answer he was looking for, but it's hard because you, you want to meet somebody where they are and, and not necessarily shame them or make them feel like if they don't buy fair trade, then they're somehow doing something wrong. That I would recommend against. Right. Meet them where they are. Yeah. Um, that's a very good advice. And for everyone else, definitely um, I encourage you to check out the resources section, which is in the Green Heart Connects uh, website, where you can find out more about this. And hopefully this will help you have those conversations and um, just to learn more about it, um, as for sure today has been very enlightening. And um, I hope that the takeaway from today is a, a reminder of the importance of fair trade, especially as we go into the holiday season where we're most likely going to be purchasing more items than usual. So Chris, thank you so much uh, for joining us today and for sharing your knowledge. And uh, we appreciate everything that you do. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, it was a lovely opportunity, thank you. Excellent. And for everyone else, stay tuned to hear from our friend in Ghana. We have thousands of Green Heart friends and partners from around the world who share our commitment to connecting people and planet. While they may not be experts in fair trade, they have a lot of passion and most importantly, some of them have taken steps to bring positive change to their local community. So today, we have asked Godwin Bafour, a Green Heart Grant recipient from Ghana, to share with you what he has done to help rural women gain income and livelihood through the weaving and selling of baskets. Here is his story. Hello everybody, my name is Godwin T. Bafo and I'm from West Africa, Ghana. I executed my Green Heart Service Grant project in the year 2018. My project was basically to empower vulnerable women in a rural community by creating livelihood through the weaving of baskets. With the help of Green Heart Service Grant project, 15 women, vulnerable women, women who are peasant farmers living in a deprived community and having a huge family to cater for were trained to acquire the necessary skills in the weaving of baskets. These baskets were sold locally and internationally and these women got the necessary monies to help them sustain them to continue weaving the baskets. Although the project ended in December 2018 as I speak the women are still carrying on with the activity of making more baskets and selling. And thanks to Green Heart for making this a reality. Thank you. I'm <laughs> 
Thank you to Godwin for caring for these women and for wanting to help, and most importantly, for taking action. Do you have an idea to share with us about fair trade or taking care of our environment, of each other, or personal growth ideas? If you do, please email us your idea at connects at greenheart.org. We would love to hear from you and potentially feature you on an upcoming Greenheart Connects episode or highlight you on our social media channels. There's so much that I've personally learned today. Thank you so much to Chris Salt for joining us and thank you to Godwin for sharing today. And thanks to all of you who participated and asked questions today. Looking for some inspiration as we enter the new year? If so, join us on December 17th at a new time 11 a.m. Central Time, when we talk to Holly Woods for an episode called Start the New Year with Purpose. This episode will explore getting to clarity and gaining confidence with your purpose and how you can make a difference doing what matters to you. Holly Woods is a purpose activator, coach, mentor, and business consultant who helps entrepreneurs and innovators align their life products, and businesses with their true purpose so that they can have a greater impact in the world while creating sustainable revenue and more meaning. We think you will be inspired. You are here because you want to learn about ways to care for our planet and for each other. We thank you for your commitment. Please note that there is a discount for quarterly subscriptions to Greenheart Connects. Learn more by going to greenheartconnects.org. Later today, this full episode will be available online. As a member, you can also see past episodes. So be sure to check out the resources page for more information that is shared by our speakers. And finally, please join us on our social media channels to continue the conversation and to support each other and to share what you are doing to make the world a better place. We hope to see you here again on December 17th for the next Green Heart Connects episode. Bye.